The deadly mantis. The deadly mantis. Trouble in the Arctic. Lieutenant Colonel Joe Parkman was very worried. Try to contact the weather base again, he told his radio operator. Ready, go one. Ready, go one. This is weather four. Come in, please. Weather four. The radio man waited a long time for an answer. No reply, sir, he told Joe. Joe frowned. A patrol plane had flown over the weather base not long before. Its pilot reported that the roof of the building seemed to be smashed. No people could be seen, and now the weather base did not respond to the call. What could have happened? There had been almost no storms in the area. Weather 4 was an outpost of the Dew Line, the distant early warning network of radar stations. It was located on the frozen Arctic Ocean, miles from any settlement. Its radar searched the sky for weather data and also kept watch against the invading Russian aircraft that might try to fly over the North Pole. Did the Russians have something to do with the trouble at Weather 4? Joe Parkman felt his blood run cold. The year was 1956 and the Dew Line was, the, was brand new. Joe was the commander of an Air Force interceptor base that was part of the line. If Russians invaded North America, Joe's men would see their, them and be first to meet the enemy. He would have to see what had gone wrong at Weather 4 himself. America's security might depend on it. Get my plane ready. Joe Parkman and Lieutenant Fred Pizarro flew a skip plane to Weather 4. They discovered that one wall was pushed in and the roof was partly torn off. There were no signs of the men who should have been on duty. Fred shook his head in belief. Two men don't just vanish. Joe examined the wreckage as he spoke. But they did. Not a trace of them. And no signs of whatsoever did this damage. Looks like a plane hit the roof, said Fred. But where is it? The wind howled through the broken roof and walls and snow covered the equipment. No blood. No footprints, nothing, said Fred. I guess we can't blame the Russians for this, Colonel. No, agreed Colonel Joe. It doesn't look like it. Perhaps it was a freak storm that didn't show up on our radar. A, a small tornado, maybe, that might have caused this kind of damage. But that can't explain the missing men, Fred said. Joe and Frank examined the snowy ice around the wrecked hut. There's something funny, Joe said, bending down. He had discovered two ruts in the snow. They were like skid marks made by an aircraft, but no plane had never made that short a takeoff run. A chopper, Fred suggested. Look at the edges of the ruts. They have the strange little prints, almost like feathers. No, no helicopter did this. Well, then what did, Fred asked, but Joe had no answer. There was nothing the two men could do but return to the base. A day later, there was more trouble. A cargo plane from Alaska disappeared off the radar, and Joe set out search planes. They spotted the wreckage. Once again, Joe Parkman and Fred Pizarro went to examine the scene. The wreck was on snow-covered ice. This plane was smashed from above, Joe exclaimed. See, this damage could not have been caused by the crash. This is another strange one, Fred. He poked through the torn metal. There were no bodies. Look at this, Joe cried suddenly. He had found a weird object. It was flat and greenish colored and as tall as a man. One end was pointed. What in the world is this? Fred asked. Joe lifted the thing up. It did not weigh much. I've never seen anything like it before, Joe said. It's almost like, like a tooth or a claw, but it can't be. See how one end is broken? Ugh. Some kind of gunk is coming out of the broken end, Fred noted. What will he do with it? Take it back to the base, Joe decided. I want Dr. Carver to have a look at it. I wonder what it is. I don't know. Let's find out. Joe called the base doctor to examine the mystery object as soon as he returned. What do you think, Doc? Joe inquired. The doctor shook his head. He touched the gooey matter that dripped from the thing's broken end. This isn't bone, Dr. Carver said, and it's much too large to be a tooth or a claw. I just don't know. Could this thing have anything to do with the crash of the cargo plane, Joe asked. You've got me, the doctor said. Joe looked grim. We'll send it to NORAD. NORAD's at the big base over there where they find out 
destroy, uh, keep the Russians from attacking us back then. We'll send it to NORAD. General Ford will have to decide what to do next. The mystery deepens. Some days later, in a city thousands of miles south of the Arctic, a scientist sat in his office in a large museum. On his desk was a small skeleton, which he covered, carefully studied. There was a knock on the door. Come in, called Dr. Ned Jackson, still tinkering with the skeleton. Oh, hello, Marge. Marge Blaine, who was in charge of the museum's magazine, came into the office to show Ned some photos. What have you got there, she asked. Another fossil? Oh, no, 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 replied. he replied. No, he replied. One of the kids in my junior science group mounted this cat skeleton, but he forgot some of the bones. How can you tell, Marge asked. It looks fine to me, four legs, tails, ribs, and stuff. Ned laughed. It's the business of a paleontologist to know. Now, now look very closely. He stopped as the phone rang. Hello? Yes, this is Jackson. What? The Pentagon calling? Marge stood open mouth while Ned listened to the voice on the phone. Then he said, I'll come right away. And he hung up. I have to go to Washington, Marge. Something about a mystery bone from the North Pole. Boy, this guy's important if they're calling him about this, right? Don't you think? When Ned Jackson arrived at the Pentagon, he found General Ford and another scientist, Mr. Gunther, examining the bone. It did not take Ned long to discover that the strange object had once been part of a living thing. But what kind of creature? This material is not true bone, Ned said. It seems more like part of an insect. An insect? Hmm. Dr. Gunther has tried to analyze the matter inside that thing, General Ford said, but he can't tell what it might be. Let's take the museum, Ned suggested. We can do more extensive tests there. General Ford agreed to Ned's suggestion. After a day or two, Ned and Gunther had the answer. The strange object was indeed part of an insect, but insects had to be the biggest one the world had ever seen. Marge Blaine heard about the discovery and came to see Ned. What's this about a giant bug, she said. Oh, it's true, Dr. Gunther told her. The thing found in the Arctic was the spur, or wings or legs, of a huge insect. Ages ago, there were enormous insects on Earth, and now it seems that at least this one giant fossil insect has come to life. A mantis, Ned said. One of the fiercest, most deadliest insects of all. Ned opened a book for Marge. Here's a picture of one. Today's mantises are small, only two or five inches long, but they're fierce little creatures. They hold their legs up like they're praying and then pounce. The front legs have sharp spines to hold the victim. Mantises eat their food alive. But this, spot, but this spine you have got is huge, Marge, Marge exclaimed in horror. And the insect that came from... Ned finished for must be bigger than a house. That's why the Air Force has asked me to come to the Arctic to investigate. I'm leaving today. <gasps> You're going to need a photographer, said Marge. I'm ready to go when you are. So Marge is going to hang along. She's going to say, whoa, what's up? Ned's got to go check out what's going on. Menace from the past. Ned and Marge flew north to the Arctic Interceptor Base. Colonel Joe Parkman welcomed them. I hope you can help us solve our mystery, Joe said. We'll do our best, Ned assured him. There's been another report of a strange attack, Joe said. An Eskimo village was terrorized and one man was killed. The people say it was an evil spirit, a giant monster. That's nonsense, of course. Don't be too sure, said Ned. Joe Parkman flew. Ned marched to the scene of the crash cargo plane. They looked at the odd skid marks in the snow. We found marks like this next to the weather station that was destroyed, Joe said. There were more, more of them at the Eskimo village. Eight and a half feet, explained Marge, as Ned measured the skid-like track. What does that mean, Dr. Jackson? asked Joe. Let's get back to the base, said Ned, and I'll try to explain. It's a good thing Ned's there. Honestly, what would happen if he, would, you know, if he, if he wasn't there? They wouldn't be able to investigate. The bleak Arctic night closed in. The Air Force Base, located in the midst of a snowy wilderness, was snug and warm. Cheerful light shone from its windows. Music could be heard coming from the recreation hall. In one room of the base, Ned Jackson did his calculations. He explained to Joe Parkman that he believed that the giant insect was large. 
killing people because there was nothing else for it to eat in the wasteland. Outside in the snowy light, inhuman eyes were studying the lighted buildings. The enormous creature was very hungry. Inside the base, Ned was saying, I know a giant insect seems impossible, Colonel Parkman, but millions of years ago, there were dragonflies three feet wide. That was millions of years ago, Joe said dryly. The evidence points to the giant mantis, Ned said. Perhaps it was frozen to a block of ice ages ago, and now for some reason it's been released. Perhaps there was a volcanic eruption deep under the Arctic Ocean. Well, why haven't we seen the thing before, Joe asked. Mantises can fly, Ned replied. There are lots of hiding places in the Arctic ice flows. Or suddenly Marge Blaine screamed, At the window! There was the sound of breaking glass. Marge yelled again. A huge insect claw bristling with deadly spines thrust into the room. The people, the people fled. Sound the alarm, Joe Parkman cried. There was a great crash and the building rocked and the lights blinked. Overhead, the roof began to creak and bend downward and then Joe reached the intercom. Condition red, condition red, he yelled to make into the mic. Get all planes airborne at once. This is Colonel Joe Parkman speaking. Condition red, condition red. Marge and Ned ran to safety as the roof in that part of the airbase began to collapse. Men grabbed their weapons and threw on parkas and raced outside. They could not believe what they saw. There in the strong beam of light was a towering form. It had a pointed head with round gleaming eyes. Its arms were like blades of knives, all studded with cruel spines. The creature hopped from the roof of a crushed hut and attacked a group of men. The airmen fired round after round of bullets from their rifles. <laughs> the mantis kept coming. One man raised a machine gun and began to fire. <laughs> the mantis uttered an ugly hiss. <laughs> and then it roared. Its wings began to beat. <laughs> making a terrible humming sound. <gasps> it's taking off. Somebody yelled, look out, look out. The men fell flat. There was a great blast of wind. <laughs> and when the men looked up, the giant mantis had disappeared. Oh no, the mantis flies south. The plane from the interceptor base searched in vain for the deadly mantis. There was no sign of it, but a Canadian radar station hundreds of miles to the south reported an odd blip. It was not an aircraft. It was very low in the air, out over the stormy sea. <gasps> Could it be the mantis? Marge asked Ned Jackson. Perhaps the creature's instinct is leading it south, the scientist said. Mantises are mostly found in the tropics. Perhaps this huge thing is trying to turn its ancient home. The jungle left a million years ago. Ned's guess was right, but before the mantis could reach warm climate, it would stop for food along the way. Marge and Ned could do mo no more in the Arctic. They flew home to Washington, D.C. Colonel Joe Parkman went south with them. He was needed to help organize the defense against the deadly insect. Joe appeared on television to explain the danger. I saw this creature attack our base, Joe said. It's real, it's not a dream. He showed a picture of an ordinary mantis. This is what the thing looks like. Normally a mantis is only a few inches long, but this mantis is not normal. Joe held up a model of a C-47 airplane. The mantis was almost twice as long. We believe that this giant insect is now flying south over the Atlantic Ocean, Joe said. Some ships are reporting missing. The mantis may have attacked them, and it may decide to come ashore at any time. Keep alert, watch the sky, and don't panic. If you see this thing, notify your local police or Air Force base. Thank you. The Air Force to the rescue again. I'm glad I was in the Air Force. Later, Joe got together with Ned and Marge. They tried to plot the course of the mantis on a map. It could be in our area already, Ned said. I'm so tired, Marge said. I don't care. Will you drive me home? Well, of course. <gasps> mm, sounds like a little bit of... It sounds like a little bit of a, uh, of a, um, it sounds like a little bit of a romance going on there. Mm -hmm. As Joe and March drove along a foggy road, they listened to the radio. News of nearby train wreck was broadcast. That's close by, Marge exclaimed. Do you think it could be the work of the mantis? Joe laughed. I hardly think so, but we'll have a look. They reached the wreck. The police thought it was just an ordinary accident. Marge sighed. Oh, I suppose they're right, he, she said. 
She and Joe got back into the car. They never noticed the strange skid marks in the dust behind the railroad. Skid marks? Skid marks. Skid marks. Wow, we got to watch out for those skid marks, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that, was, that was a bad joke. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Drove on. The fog became thicker. Suddenly, the radio said, we interrupt this to present this news flash. A bus has just been demolished in a mystery accident along Arlington Road. Joe made a quick U-turn and raced off to the scene of the accident. He and Marge found a bus slip on its side. A woman passed through was screaming. Joe got out to see what had happened. The driver's body's missing, he said. Missing body? Oh, no. I was his last passenger, the woman wept. He, he told me to be careful. And, and the thing, the terrible thing, oh, she fell into the arms of the state trooper. Let's get out of here. Let's run. No. The mantis in New York. After its attack in the bus, the mantis struck again. It menaced the area around Washington, D.C. The Air Force sent fighter jets to attack the deadly insect. The plane fired rockets at it and dove into the sea. But they could not shoot it down. The mantis could fly faster than a jet plane. It winged off northeast and it dropped so low that it could not be picked up by radar. Ned was with General Ford at the mantis defense headquarters in Washington. They created, they created, they created a mantis defense. <laughs> Come on, they created a mantis defense center. All right, in Washington. Um, we've lost it, exclaimed the general. What can you do about it? Ned asked. We can hope that a member of the ground observer team will spot the thing. It's certain to head Joe back to land. That's, they had a whole bunch back then when they were so worried about bombs falling on us that they would have people that actually civilians looking for planes to make sure. Because back then, we, we were really paranoid and with good reason, of course. All right. We can hope that the member of the ground observer team will spot the thing, said Ford. It's certain to head back to land. Joe, Colonel Joe Parkman was in the air with the squadron pursuing the mantis. His radio crackled with a new report. Mantis sighted over Baltimore. Moments later, there was another report. Mantis over Newark. The jets screamed through the sky. Joe sighted the mantis and yelled, there it is, there it is. He peeled off to the deck. Rocket slammed into the mantis. The thing faltered in the air. And then it headed straight for Joe's plane. The plane and the giant insect collided in midair. Joe barely had time to pop the canopy and parachutes. The mantis fluttered down. Below was the city of New York. Joe's plane fell into the East River. He landed safely near the docks and was rescued by the police. I is it dead was the first question he asked. No, a policeman told him. It's wounded. It went into the Manhattan Tunnel under the river. We're trying to smoke it out. Hours went by. After a brief rest, Joe went into the tunnel. He found General Ford there together with Ned and Marge. Smashed autos littered the tunnel entrance. We've got the tunnel sealed off at the other end, the general said. Volunteers are getting ready to go in after it. I'm going too, said Joe. I've got a right to be in the finish of this thing as much as any other man. The general explained that they were hoping to try to kill a mantis with poison gas. If he smashes the tunnel, the general said, we'll have a flood on our hands. We'll have to get to him now. But inside the tunnel came the roar of the mantis. <laughs> I'm ready, Joe told the general. Good luck, Joe, said Marge. She had tears in her eyes as Joe waved to her and went to brief his men. The volunteers were all Air Force men dressed in gas-proof suits. You have been told what we have to do, said Joe. The smoke will give us cover, and so will the cars and the mantis overturned inside the tunnel. The gas bombs will only work in a limited area. Wait for my signal before you throw them. Everybody ready? Ready! These guys are, these guys are great. Ready, said all the men. Well, then let's go after it, said Joe. He led the way in the tunnel. I like Joe. Just like that hero guy, you know? Yay, Joe! Go, Joe! Go, Joe! Cautiously, they made their way into the smoke. Inside the tunnel, a huge creature was uttering its unearthly screeches. It was badly wounded. Joe knew that any mistake was likely to be fatal. 
They trudged along. Smashed cars and trucks were everywhere, but there were no bodies. The mantis had been hungry, and it had found food. Oh. Let's hope we're not dessert, Joe muttered to himself. The tunnel lights shone dimly in the thick smoke. Then suddenly the men came into the area where the smoke was less dense. Many of the tunnel lights were the section that had gone out. Ahead lay blackness. The screeching! The mantis echoed from the tunnel walls. The men were sweating inside the heavy suits. Was it the heat or was it fear? I think it's fear, don't you? They kept walking. Easy, men, said Joe. All at once there was a terrible clang and the sound of rending metal. The head of the mantis appeared in the darkness, looming over the roofs of the smashed cars. Get back, Joe cried, get back! I'm glad he's there to take charge, man. Go, 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 Joe! All right. One of the men let out burst from machine gun. The mantis gave an awful bell. And then it retreated into the dark. After it, Joe exclaimed, get those gas grenades ready. The mantis shrieked. Joe showed his powerful flashlight into the black depths of the tunnel. The light reflected from two huge eyes. <gasps> there it is, Joe shouted. It's right there. It's trapped against that pile of red cards. Give it all you got. Outside the tunnel, General Ford, Ned Jackson, and Marsh Blaine waited. <laughs> they could hear the roars of the trapped monster. <laughs> they could also hear the short bursts of gunfire. What do you think's happening, Marge asked fearfully. Well, what do you think's happening, Marge? I just hate it. Back then, they treated women like they're idiots, and they're not. They're <laughs> my wife's smarter than I am. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, an explosion rang out, then another. More sounds of gunfire echoed inside the tunnel. The screams of the deadly matches became louder and louder. <laughs> I think it's coming this way. Look out, look out, it's coming this way. General Ford exclaimed, everybody get back. Joe and the men had used all the weapons. They had exploded poison gas grenades and shot the mantis with hundreds of bullets. Back outside, men, Joe shouted. There's nothing more we can do. He and the men dashed back through the tunnel. They could hear the sound of the mantis bellowing behind them. <laughs> the giant creature was following. Joe was the last one to reach the entrance. He staggered outside and pulled off the hood of his suit. He stood still listening. Everything was quiet. General Ford and Ned and Marge and a policeman rushed up. Listen, do you hear anything? The five people were silent. Inside the tunnel, only a few tiny noises could be heard. Do you suppose it's dead, Marge whispered? The gas is harmless now, Joe said. I'm going back to look inside to look. I'll come with you, said Ned. Marge clutched her camera. You don't expect me to stay behind, do you? Now, Marge is a photographer. She's got to go in and, and uh, get the pictures, right? There among the many smashed cars lay the giant insect, unmoving. They came close to the creature. Their footsteps echoed in the tunnel. The mantis said seemed to be as large as a Volkswagen. It had jaws like jointed tentacles. One enormous arm, all studded with spines, lay on the pavement along the wrecked cars. How is that for the cover of a museum magazine? Ned asked jokingly. Marsh looked up at the thing, speechless. Well, what are you waiting for, Joe said with a smile, giving a little sarcasm, of course. Oh, you're a girl. You're going to be scared to do this. You know, nowadays, women just go, yeah, I'm going to take that picture. Marsh took one small step toward the mantis. She lifted her camera. General Forge came to speak to Joe. The two of them moved away to confer with the police chief. Frowning, Marsh peered through the viewfinder of her camera. The shot was not quite right, and so she moved away from Ned closer to the creature's arm. Oh, oh, now I've got it, she said. Ned cried, look out, Marge, look out, oh no. The deadly arm moved up. Its sharp spines hovered just above Marge's head. She screamed and dropped her camera. She had seen what, the, what was happening. Run, Marge, run, he called. But she seemed paralyzed, of course, because she's a woman, right? Right? That's how they treated you guys back then. But she seemed paralyzed. Joe raced up to her and scooped her into his arms. He stumbled away as the giant claw shot down toward them and fell with a harmless crash on the tunnel pavement. Marge and Joe were safe. Still in his arms, she turned to him and said, 
You said it was dead, she said. Well, it is, Marge, said Ned. The movement was just the last reflex action. The mantis will never harm anyone again, thanks to Joe and his men. Thanks to Joe, man. Thanks, Joe, thanks a lot, man. Good job. Then I'd better take several pictures of the hero, Marge said. She smiled at Joe. If he ever gets around to putting me down. <laughs> oh, that's that little bit of, that's that little bit of, you know, like cute life, you know, a little romance in there. All right, this is from the monster movies. I know you don't have it there. But this is from the monster movie series. I really love this book. It was fun to read it to you. And I hope you enjoyed watching it.